Ecology of Everyday Life, Rethinking the Desire for Nature, by Kaya Heller, published by Black Rose Books, 1999. Chapter 4 The Five Fingers of Social Desire, The Dimensions of the Socio-Erotic The cultural landscape within the age of global capital leaves much to be desired. Looking out across any small town, suburb, or city in the United States we can detect two yellow glints, McDonald's arches poking up into the sky, competing with the white church steeples that used to dominate the horizon. The glaring signs of fast food chains and the endless sound bites of telecommunications are tropes of a brave new service economy an economy that has been equated with the despiritualization of culture itself. Capitalist standardization and regularization have encroached into our everyday lives reducing social, cultural and political relationships to consumer and producer as we buy and sell standardized food, infotainment, health care, new age religion, education and even political representatives. In turn, as the cultural landscape succumbs to social alienation and erosion, the natural landscape deteriorates as well. Each night, newscasters announce the arrival of yet another endangered species or a disaster of the week, another hurricane, tornado, earthquake or flood resulting from greenhouse-induced climatic instability. And while the natural world is literally disintegrating, it is also being rationalized on unprecedented levels reduced to genetic natural resources to be surveyed, patented, and sold for profit. How we interpret these events is deeply significant. Whether we attribute these rationalizations to a failed spiritual or romantic orientation or to centuries of capitalist-driven industry and an authoritarian state, such interpretations have tremendous implications for how we address problems of social and ecological injustice. Whereas a focus on the former tends to bring the revolution into a more contemplative and individualistic mood, the latter opens the way for a critique of hierarchical institutional structures. Yet it is not necessary to engender a false dilemma between spirituality and politics in order to address issues of social and ecological change. Rather, we may develop new ways to talk about questions of meaning, quality, sensibility, or spirituality ways that are integral to talking about institutional and political change. For the common link between ideas of meaning and ideas of structure is the idea of relationality. The idea of social relationships is integral to the idea of social structures, non-hierarchical structures that facilitate meaningful cooperative social relationships in all areas of our lives. This chapter initiates a discussion of how to recast common understandings of meaning that are conventionally framed in spiritual or romantic terms, ways to discuss those meaningful aspects of social and ecological life that are degraded by capital-driven technology and state formations, ways to talk about those aspects of reality that cannot be reduced to capitalist rationalization with its productionist idiom of means ends, bottom lines, or standardization. Moving beyond dualistic concepts such as spirit provides the opportunity to cultivate new metaphors for articulating that which is intensely meaningful and connective, metaphors that are derived from a relational tradition of eros. By shifting from discussions of spirituality or romantic idealization to idioms of the erotic and social desire, we are better able to transcend binaries between the spiritual and the political that currently limit discussions of social and ecological justice. Beyond rationalization, from S.B.I. Ryrus to Eros the McDonald'sization of culture is often associated with the dramatic decline in the quality of social and ecological relationships. Reducing social relationships to predetermined interactions between server and servee, each aspect of a McDonald's is prescribed, regularized, number crunched, and market analyzed. The McDonald's idiom is so embedded in everyday cultural practice that McDonald's itself may serve as a symbol of the cultural effects of advanced capitalist rationalization. Note. Benjamin Barber, in his book Jihad vs. McWorld, elaborates upon the idea of McDonald's as a metaphor for the mood and mechanism of advanced capital. For Barber, the parallel emergences of global capital and religious fundamentalism represent a paradoxically complementary threat to democracy itself. C. Barber, Jihad v. McWorld, New York, Random House 1995 Also, for a truly stimulating discussion of the meaning of service economy in an era of flexible accumulation, see David Harvey's The Condition of Postmodernity, Cambridge, Blackwell, 
1990. End note. McDonald's translation of assembly line industrial practice to service production typifies all that is dispirited within advanced capitalism. However, the problem of capitalist rationalization has a history that began long before the appearance of those plastic golden arches. At the time of the century Max Weber described the disenchantment of everyday life and work due to modern capitalist rationalization. Note. Max Weber initiated a century-long discussion of the idea of disenchantment. The term re-enchantment was popularized by students of Weber, members of the Frankfurt School including Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, and Herbert Marcuse. Both terms have subsequently captured the imaginations of a range of theorists engaged in postmodern and ecological discourse thinkers searching for a way to talk about the erosion of meaning and ecological integrity within modern and postmodern capitalism. End note. For Weber, a rationalized capitalism implied a disciplined labor force and the regularized investment of capital, practices that entail the continual accumulation of wealth for its own sake. Contemporary critiques of such principles as profit over quality of life, regularization over individual expression, and standardization of everyday life, are often derived from Weber's description of the cultural implications of a modern capitalism. Yet Weber's crucial insights into the cultural implications of capitalism have often been upstaged by popular critiques of modernity that emphasize rationality and spiritual decay as causes of an impoverished quality of everyday life and work. As in the case of early eco-fascism in Germany instead of critiquing capitalist rationalization, theorists blamed modem rationality for society's ills. Note. See Janet Beale and Peter Stoutenmeier, Eco-Fascism. Lessons from the German Experience, London, AK Press, 1995. End note. And rather than fight capitalism by creating cooperative social and political institutions, such critics fought the cultural and ecological effects of capitalism by proposing a spirituality and anti-rationality that would either coexist with, or perhaps reform, the capitalist system. Yet the cause of cultural and ecological degradation is indeed capitalist rationalization, not a modem fall from spiritual grace. And if capitalism is a set of social relationships based on exploitation, regularization, alienation, and commodification, then the antidote to capitalist rationalization is a new relationality, an empathetic, sensual, and rational way of relating that is deeply cooperative, pleasurable, and meaningful. Instead of pitting the idea of spirit against the idea of rationality we need to cultivate a new rational and empathetic orientation capable of destabilizing capitalist rationalization. We need to move beyond a focus on spirituality to a focus on a rational and empathetic relationality to create institutions that will nurture cooperative ways of relating socially and ecologically. However, the shift from spirituality to a relationality entails a great leap for Westerners steeped in normative dualisms between spirit and matter, or intuition, and rationality. Just as we learn that black is the opposite of white, we learn that rationality is the opposite of intuition and spirituality. Accordingly when disenchanted by a rationalized and McDonaldian world, we confuse rationalization with rationality and look immediately to intuition and spirit for both solace and a solution. Today when we appeal to the term spirituality to discuss cultural and ecological meaning, we end up taking home more than we bargained for. Anchoring contemporary ideas of social and ecological integrity to ancient dualistic activating principles perpetuates reductive and polarized understandings of reality. The term spirit is embedded within the psychic trenches of Western metaphysical dualism. Its origin can be traced to the Latin spiritus, an activating principle that was believed to animate an inert, feminine, and passive body with the invigorating properties of breath. According to the ancient Romans, it is when we breathe, spirare, an eternal breath, spiritus, that an otherwise inactive and ephemeral body comes to life. Conversely it is when spiritus leaves the body that we die. And when we blend this Western notion of spirituality with non-Western systems of meaning, we face another set of problems. The journey from a non-Western language into the language of Spiritus is a tricky one indeed. Hopes to find in pagan, Neolithic, Eastern, and indigenous religious practices, 
a non-dualistic understanding of spirit are undermined by appeals to a dualistic linguistic tradition of spiritus, a tradition predicated on ideas of activating principles counterposed to a passive matter. While the idea of spiritus, or breath, is appealing to ecologically oriented theorists, for the ancient Romans, spiritus entailed a breath that activated an otherwise dead body. Today we know that breath does not activate but rather, is functionally integral to a body that is already very much alive. Still faced with the need for a metaphorical antidote to the problem of capitalist rationalization, a trend in society that cheapens all that is meaningful, we must engender other ways to articulate meaning. Disenchanted with capital-driven science and techniques that promise to render all knowledge and experience operative, useful, and efficient, theologians are left with few alternatives, other than spiritus for describing meaningful practice and perception. Such theorists yearn to be able to point to qualities of reality that are irreducible qualities that cannot be known or conveyed through the language of logical positivism, behaviorism, biological determinism, or physics. Note. The question of mystery has dominated much discussion in feminist and ecological circles. Rightly dismayed by reductive analytical reasoning that reduces phenomena to meaningless fragments in the pursuit of rational knowledge, many thinkers have advocated embracing the idea of mystery as a way to point to moments of irreducible meaning. Such discussions have led to pleas to put mystery back into politics as a way to re-enchant an otherwise instrumental political practice. For a brief discussion of mystery, see Inistra King, The Necessity of History and Mystery, in Woman of Power 1988. End note. Moreover, such thinkers long to be able to convey the possibility of knowing the poetry of bodies and the natural world, illustrating the irreducible quality of the connections between bodies and within bodies themselves. However, there is another tradition to which we may appeal. Leaving the world of spiritual metaphysics, we may engage another way of talking about meaning. There exists another kind of principle that, while not activating, or spiritual, is relational and social. The term eros contains an idea of love, an expression of desire between individuals. It is in the space between individuals, within the hearts of individuals, that eros flourishes. Eros, then, represents an embodied quality of social relationships and attraction, passion, and yearning of oneself for other selves. However, to emphasize the relational and social quality of Eros, we must first establish an understanding that is distinct from the Freudian definition that reduced Eros to a physical energy. Note. The modem transmogrification of Eros, a pre-Olympian deity who, born of chaos, personified love in all of its aspects, into an energy or life force is most closely associated with Sigmund Freud. Modeling the human psyche after the steam pump, Freud described the psychic world as a mechanism analogous to a series of pressure chambers activated by the fluctuating pressure and release of steam energy. Freud transformed the mythological narrative of Eros into this mechanistic model, establishing Eros as a steam-like impulse energy force, or drive that would propel social behavior. Also, for a more historical and social discussion of Eros, see Herbert Marcuse Eros and Civilization, Boston, The Beacon Press. 1955. Although Marcuse retains the energistic approach to Eros taken by Freud, he pioneered a discussion of Eros as a potentially constructive social impulse. End note. Freud reconstituted the idea of Eros into an energistic life force that must be repressed in surrender to a civilizing reality principle. In the era of liberal capitalism, desire is often cast within energistic or individualized terms and it is usually framed in terms of scarcity as the will to overcome a particular deprivation, replacing desire with a particular object of want that is external to the self. Note. According to Nicholas Zenos, it is within classical liberal theory that we first see an explicit theory of scarcity associated with ideas of need, desire, individualism, and capitalism. See Nicholas Zenos, Scarcity and Modernity, New York, Routledge. 1989. End note. However, when we shake our theoretical kaleidoscope slightly we may reconfigure the idea of desire as a will to express a potentiality that lies not outside of ourselves, but inside our very being, inside our social and political communities. 
we may articulate an idea of a potential to express sensuality sociability and creativity in all of its delectable complexity a potential for social desire that exists within us at every given moment, not as an individual triumph over an inner emptiness, but as a social and cooperative expression of a fullness that yearns to emerge. And yet, when we seek to elaborate discussions of social desire, we are confronted by a linguistic and conceptual vacuum, while the language of liberal capitalism offers a rich vocabulary for describing what is antisocial, it offers an impoverished vocabulary for describing the cooperative impulse. We'll know far more about antisocial, irrational desires such as greed, acquisitiveness, domination, and competition, than we do about desires that enhance the subjectivity of both self and other. In Tum, as Michel Foucault points out, we are indeed saturated by discourses on sexuality. Note. For a discussion of the emergence of sexual discourses in Western history, see Michel Foucault, History of Sexuality Volume 1, New York, Vintage Books, 1980. End note. However, we have a paucity of discourses on social desires for creativity and solidarity. As we move beyond an energistic Freudian idiom of forces, repression, drives, and release eros could represent a metaphor for sociality itself. The idea of eros, or the more vernacular term, the erotic, provides a metaphor for a quality of social relationships that is passionate, loving, mutualistic, and empathetic. And building upon the idea of the erotic, we may point to a cooperative dimension of desire. We may speak of a socio-erotic, a spectrum of social and sensual desires that enhance social cooperation and a progressive revolutionary impulse. The socio-erotic, as a metaphor for a relational orientation that may counter capitalist rationalization, places social and cultural criticism on much firmer ground. Instead of conflating rationalization with a rationality to be countered by an irrational spirit, we may appeal to the idea of a socio-erotic a way of talking about an impulse toward collectivitous sensuality and non-hierarchy that may be nourished and encouraged by the creation of non-hierarchical institutions. The idea of a socio-erotic, or a spectrum of social desires is implicit within many feminist and social anarchist writings that reveal the delicate and crucial link between desire and freedom. The desire for a quality of life that is sensual, cooperative, creative, and ethical resonates with the impulse for a way of life that is not only based on justice and equality but on a profound sense of freedom as well. The socio-erotic represents the spectrum of social desires that emerges from this longing for freedom, this impulse toward an interdependent and harmonious world. The very act of thinking through the socio-erotic represents an exercise in strolling the perimeters of a passionate landscape that could potentially encompass the full scope of our personal, social, and political lives. The project to further elaborate understandings of desire is central to ecology. By exploring the social desire for ecological justice and integrity we may begin to uncover new ways to articulate what it is that we really yearn for when we talk about nature. Often framed in terms of a spiritual or romantic longing for connectedness, wholeness, and integrity the social desire for nature is often contrasted to universalizing notions of rationality and technology that are accused of destroying all that is good in the world. Note. For a critical examination of technology within contemporary ecological discourse see Murray Buchlin, Reenchantung Humanity, London, Castle, 1995. End note. Again, conflating rationality with a particular kind of rationalization, nature lovers often propose a return to an intuition and spirituality that would better resonate with ecological principles such as connectedness, diversity, or interdependence. However, as we shall see, it is possible to think rationally with great feeling, about the social desire for nature. Instead of appealing to ideas of spirit and intuition to identify moments of meaning, connectedness, and integrity we may appeal to the embodied and relational idiom of the socio-erotic. The Five Fingers of Social Desire When a child reaches out to the world, it reaches with both hands. Often, the child reaches for something it needs physically or for some form of social interaction that it desires. As we dive into the vast blue world of the socio-erotic, we no longer define desire as the singular will to satisfy an individualistic longing for that which we do not have, 
nor do we reduce desire to material need. Instead, we may explore desire as a rich dialectic, as a yearning to unfold all that we can feel and do together within a free society. In particular, social desire represents an organic and profoundly social spectrum of potentialities, inclinations, or tendencies. It represents a will to know ourselves, each other, and the world. From within this spectrum of social desire, there emerge five dimensions of desire, five fingers of social desire, which are implicit within the social tradition itself. These dimensions are linked to the desire for sensuality association, differentiation, development, and political opposition. And like the graceful movements of a hand, the socio-erotic can best grasp the world when all five fingers and palm work in unison. Sensual Desire, the Desire to Know Let us begin with one of the most common understandings of desire, one with which we are most familiar. The first finger of desire, sensual desire, is the desire for sensual expression, satisfaction and engagement with anyone, or all, of our senses. Sensual desire begins with the assertion, I want to know, sensually, engaging ourselves on a visceral level. The idea of sensual desire represents the most unmediated dimension of desire, referring to a will to know through the senses, to express our potential for sensual enjoyment and experience. When we think of sensual desire, we may think of the way children seek out the world through their mouths and fingers, yearning in return for nourishment and affection. We may let the little finger symbolize sensual desire, the desire to delight in our senses, which incorporates itself within all other dimensions of social desire. Within sensual desire, we also immediately discover a dimension of social meaning, for we see that it is impossible to consider the idea of sensual desire without situating this desire within a specific social context. Indeed, there is no pre-social sensual desire. While infants are born with a suckling instinct, they must learn to respond to the world visually, tactually, and orally. The ability to glean pleasure from gazing at the world, the ability to distinguish and interpret sensations around us emerges from the stimulation of caretakers who gaze into an infant's eyes, touching and cooing at them in an engaging manner. It is through being sensually stimulated within a social relationship, that infants develop the ability to recognize, integrate, and enjoy sensual stimulation. In this way, the capacity for cultivating and expressing sensual desire is predicated on a deeply relational social context. In addition, sensual desire is culturally constrained. While we may desire sensual engagement through our senses by eating, drinking, hearing, smelling, or touching the world, the way in which we approach and encode these sensual practices is overwhelmingly informed by the culture in which we live. Similarly the sensual desire for nature is a social form of desire. In the West, for instance, from the day we are born, we develop culturally specific understandings of what we will categorize as natural as well as what aspects of this nature we will find appealing. As illustrated by theorist Donna Haraway, historical understandings of landscape, the pastoral, wilderness, and animality inform the ability to identify and respond to those sensual aspects of ecological reality we take for granted as natural. Note. See Donna Haraway, Simeons, Cyborgs, and Women, The Reinvention of Nature, New York, Routledge, 1991. End note. Sensual desire is contingent upon social, cultural, and political practices that establish the standards by which we distinguish such sensual values as beauty strength, grace, and taste. Whether we express a desire to see, touch, smell, or talk to another person, this desire to associate sensually is both socially constrained and facilitated. And because we endow these social interactions with specifically sensual contexts, such as in the sharing of food, music, dance, or sexuality we imbue these associative activities with a dimension of sensual desire as well. Associative desire, the desire to know other. Associative desire, the second finger of social desire, adds another dimension by beginning with the assertion, I want to know you. Whereas association is not always explicitly physical or sexual, there exists a dimension of sensuality within an association between people who feel related or bonded. 
This sensuality may range from the flow of voices or hand gestures of spoken communication, to the visual gaze between two people standing at opposite ends of a room. In Tum, we may express our desire for sensual association through activities ranging from the breaking of bread to the sharing of sexual intimacy. Hence, we may allow the ring finger to symbolize associative desire, representing the finger that is most associated with relationships, friendship, and love. As we think through the dialectic of social desire, we must regard the metaphor of the hand as only a point of departure, asking our minds to do that which the static symbol of the hand cannot, our minds can think dialectically, allowing each dimension of social desire to be incorporated and integrated into the next, bringing a cumulative and nonlinear fullness to our understanding of social desire. We may derive the idea of sensual desire from the idea of associative desire, allowing the one to give richness and meaning to the other. Hence, from the idea of sensuality we may adduce an idea of associative desire, mediating the idea of sensuality with the idea of association. Sensual, associative desire is what we commonly call love, it is the expression of bonds of friendship or lovership, the desire to create and maintain bonds with family community and with the stranger for whom we feel empathy. While we may not always express overt sensual desire to those with whom we feel a connection, the very idea of feeling a connection conveys the ever-present dimension of sensual desire within the associative moment. Social anarchists ranging from Peter Kropotkin to Murray Bookchin have explored this desire for association, demonstrating its salience within the revolutionary project. Human nature is marked by tendencies toward both the social and the anti-social. It is however, the social tendency that represents the potential to be cooperative, to exist within a vital social matrix on which all depend. Associative desire acts as a glue which binds people together, allowing them to express the yearning to enhance the richness of each other's material and social lives. Associative desire is precisely the human desire to fend off alienation by creating rich relationships based on degrees of interdependence and mutuality, it represents the desire to know others and to be recognized as being integral part of a relationship, group, family, or community. Associative desire is the desire to be part of a collectivity greater than the self, a striving to be part of a larger identity. In addition, it represents the desire to express and receive empathy to care for, and to be cared for, by others. In contrast, liberal capitalist society with its individualistic expression of desire, confines associative desire to the romantic private sphere, believing it unnatural for people to truly desire association and cooperation within the public spheres of economics or politics. Whereas the church attempts to mitigate this inherently selfish nature through the obligation of charity, associative desire is generally regarded as inherently reserved for the private family or for those endowed with remarkable altruistic abilities. A cooperative, associative desire within the social or political realms is regarded as the exception rather than the rule. However, as anarchism and feminism demonstrate we have the potential to express associative desire within both the public and private spheres by cultivating social relationships ranging from friendship and lovership to family community and political ties. Associative desire represents the potential which brings people to form culture and community to participate in activities as diverse as joining dubs, attending parties, and engaging in politics. For better or for worse most people have a desire to be in the presence of others, both in the intimate setting of friends and family and in the anonymity of the bustling city or marketplace. And in addition to constituting the basic desire for sociability associative desire represents the creative striving toward greater levels of mutuality and cooperation, within the matrix of a cooperative community people may create art, technologies, labor, relationships, and forms of self-government centering such practices around the desire for mutualism and interdependence. Associative desire is the tendency to create social richness, to create non-hierarchical societies with mediated decision-making systems, complementary divisions of labor, and distributive economies. In Tum, associative desire moves individuals to cultivate structures which nurture the ability to express social desire. Associative desire is most easily expressed in contexts that are cooperative, non-hierarchical, and participatory. As social anarchism demonstrates, hierarchy and competition nurture social alienation, 
creating a climate of intimidation, mistrust, and animosity. In contrast, free from hierarchy and competition, people are better able to give each other the recognition, empathy, and attention that render life meaningful. Social anarchist and feminist structures which foster mutual aid and cooperation represent the associative dimension of the socio-erotic. Cooperative structures such as rotating leadership, collective ownership, and labor, and direct participatory democracy represent but a few structural examples of the associative dimension of the socio-erotic within society. Differentiative desire, knowing self, knowing the world. However, to fully actualize its liberatory potential, associative desire must be complemented by another form of desire, differentiative desire. Differentiative desire, the third finger of desire, is the desire to differentiate oneself within the context of a social group. Yet it also represents the desire to differentiate the world to make sense of the world through artistic or intellectual creative expression. Thus, while the first dimension of differentiative desire begins with the assertion I want to know myself, the second dimension begins with the assertion, I want to know the world. The first dimension of differentiative desire represents the desire to distinguish one's own identity within a wider social context. We may let the third finger of social desire be symbolized by the middle finger, representing the need to know and express the uniqueness of the self, to uncover one's particular efficacy, skill, strength, and potentiality. Differentiative desire rounds out associative desire by adding a complementary dimension of individuality. While we each yearn to feel part of a whole that is greater than ourselves, we also yearn to know and assert a self that is distinct within that greater collectivity. While associative desire represents a kind of urge to merge, differentiative desire represents a crucial urge to diverge which allows an association to remain open to variation, innovation, and difference. Without the urge to diverge of differentiative desire, an association is at risk of remaining static, homogeneous, and stifling. The idea of differentiative desire could be termed the most western of the five dimensions of desire. In many cultures of the world people do not emphasize a notion of a self that is separable from the people. In fact, critics of western societies often identify the idea of an individuated ego as the cause of a lack of social humility and collectivity qualities which are often associated with Asian, African, and indigenous cultures throughout the world. However, particularly within the liberal capitalist West, the idea of an undifferentiated self has often proven to be anything but liberatory. Paradoxically although the idea of individualism is emphasized within the West the idea of self-surrender is prominent as well. The fascist and nationalistic legacy of Europe illustrates the consequences of self-submission to a hyper-individuated authority or to the people, or folk. As social anarchism demonstrates, Westerners must come to terms with the dangers of both hyper-individuation and hyper-association expressions of selfhood that are equally capable of thriving within hierarchical and authoritarian societies. Both tendencies are capable of nurturing despotic abuses of and submission to authority. Within the liberal capitalist West, association without differentiation enhances the likelihood of a mass of undifferentiated desires increasing the possibility that individuals will join an association whose membership is predicated on expediency or the submission to religious and political charismatic authorities. In contrast, the urge to diverge adds a complementary liberatory dimension to associative desire which allows the self to be both collective and distinct. The desire to assert an innovative identity within a given collectivity allows for an open-endedness that is essential to the development of individuals and to the collectivity itself. Feminist psychoanalytic theory has given significant attention to the potentially complementary relationship between associative and differentiative desire. According to Jessica Benjamin, each of us yearns to participate in what she calls mutual recognition a process in which two complete selves recognize each other as both dependent and independent. For Benjamin, the desire to both recognize otherness and to be recognized creates a dynamic tension which propels us to develop the capacity to recognize another person as a separate individual who is like us, yet distinct. Note. Jessica Benjamin, The Bonds of Love, Psychoanalysis, Feminism and the Problem of Domination, New York, Pantheon Books, 1988, p. 23. End note. 
For Benjamin, the idea of mutuality is predicated on this rich dialectic between two distinct selves rather than on a collapse of two selves into one. Benjamin's notion of erotic mutual recognition differs dramatically from Freud's notion of erotic union. For Freud, union between individuals represents a desire to make the one out of the more than one in which the more than one represents a static totality a suffocating unity that requires a negation of individual identity. Note. See Sigmund Freud, Civilization, and Its Discontents, New York, W. W. Norton and Company 1961. End note. For Freud, because the self is inherently hostile to encounters with other distinct selves, erotic union requires the loss of self, permitting two identities to merge into one. Thus, for Freud, the desire to become one requires a unity achieved through the negation of self. In contrast, Benjamin's mutual recognition entails a unity in diversity. It implies a unity of distinct selves based on independence and interdependence. In turn, it implies a differentiation within association, a desire to maintain individual identity while recognizing a connection to others. Together, differentiative and associative desire can form an erotic dance between autonomy community individuality and collectivity. Differentiative desire is essential to true association with and to true differentiation from others. To know the particular ways in which we are distinctive, to understand our own complex motivations, dreams, and visions, allows us to get ourselves out of the way when we seek to really see others. Paradoxically knowing self allows us to really see and know others, for when we know ourselves, including our own prejudices, motivations, likes, and dislikes, we can see all that may obscure our ability to really recognize another person. Whereas self-contemplation may represent a personal indulgence, Authentic self-knowledge may serve a vital social purpose. For what we do not know about ourselves is potentially dangerous to others. For instance, in the case of racism or sexism, social ignorance can be lethal. What men do not know about the history of being men, or about their own socialization, or about how their desire for women has been constructed, may be dangerous to women. Most white people know little about the historical origins of their ideas of race or whiteness, remaining ignorant of the ways in which they benefit from and perpetuate hegemonic racist practices. Throughout history, the oppressed have always paid dearly for what the oppressors do not know about themselves. In addition, what we do not know about ourselves is potentially dangerous to ourselves as well. Members of oppressed social groups are often deprived of knowledge of their own histories or cultures. This lack of self, or collective self-knowledge destabilizes a group and makes it further vulnerable to social control. In contrast, self-knowledge fortifies our ability to determine the degree to which we may be truly seen or known by another person. If we truly know ourselves, we are better able to assess the ability of another to perceive us accurately. In the same way, the degree to which we know ourselves heightens the degree of satisfaction we feel when another is truly able to see the qualities which render us utterly distinct. Knowing the world The second dimension of differentiative desire is the desire to know the world through creative and intellectual expression, to develop new ideas and art forms which give meaning to our lives nuancing our understanding of the world. The ability to conceptualize is predicated on the capacity to translate abstract meaning into the differentiated forms of symbol or language. Differentiative desire is the desire to differentiate the world conceptually, making meaning where there was none before, to express our interpretation of reality. From the time we are children, we take great joy in finding the right words to describe a particular feeling. Language allows us to point to specific shades of meaning allows us to experience the wondrous aha, that emerges as we elaborate a theory that explains a mystery we might never have been able to articulate before. Differentiative desire finds its expression in both the informal and formal philosophies of peoples all over the world. Although the mediums vary the desire to differentiate the world through conceptual and verbal expression is a universal phenomenon. Language gives form to our ideas and feelings allowing us to communicate the particularities of our experience. Through language, we may give shape to our experience and perceptions while also giving the world edges, texture, and meaning. Historically in the West, 
those in power have rigidly determined what would be defined as legitimate theory. The most liberatory possibilities of the Enlightenment have too often been eclipsed by a capitalist tendency toward rationalization and instrumental logic. As many feminists, social ecologists and indigenous theorists have demonstrated, the desire to differentiate the world solely through deductive, linear or instrumental reason alone, has led to a way of thinking that is often reductive, fragmented, or relativistic. However, while breaking a subject down to its components can lead to a greater understanding of the whole it can also fragment the whole into a sea of meaningless incoherent components. Hence, our desire to differentiate the world through ideas, language, and abstract conceptualization must also integrate an ethical associative moment, through thinking associatively as well as differentiatively we give ethical coherence and unity to our thoughts as well. While we may derive differentiative desire from the idea of association, differentiative desire also incorporates the idea of sensual desire. The sensual moment, we could say is retained within differentiative desire. Although reason and sensuality are dualistically portrayed as opposites, theoretical engagement is often an intensely sensual event. As sensual, embodied beings, we may appreciate moments of pleasure that emerge as we articulate an elegant, well-crafted idea or argument. Sitting among friends, wrapped in stimulating discussion, we may almost burst with the new idea percolating inside us. What could be more sensual than the great aha, that emerges from our throats when we finally grasp a new idea? This sensual moment surfaces within the act of artistic creativity itself. The artistic, Creative impulse represents the desire to engender meaning and form that express something distinctive about the self or about the world. Differentiative desire represents the desire to use our senses aesthetically to express what is deepest within the human imagination, what tingles along the tips of our fingers. Few recognize the creative impulse to be as vital as the desire for sexual or sensual fulfillment, whereas it is expected that even the most average person can achieve sensual fulfillment it is rarely expected that each can achieve creative satisfaction through artistic expression. Creativity is reserved for the elite, regarded as a mere creative means to an end that is generally quantified in terms of an economically valuable elitist product. However, the creative impulse need not constitute an instrumental means to an end. Creativity can represent a twofold end in itself, the expression of a self, and another's recognition of this self-expression. In addition to yearning to creatively differentiate the world, we also long for the world to differentiate us, to distinguish us within the grand mosaic of life itself. In this way, the experience of both creating and being recognized brings fullness to creative self-expression. However, it is not necessary that our creativity be recognized as superior, awarding us social status, power, or profit. Rather, the acts of self-expression and recognition can be sufficient in themselves. While we long to be recognized as a part of an association, we also long to be recognized as distinctive within that association. In a free and cooperative society creativity would become a dance of self-expression and recognition, reinforcing our sense of distinctiveness, community, and shared meaning. Differentiative desire is the yearning to discover what is most distinctive about ourselves on an individual, community or regional level. It is the desire to maintain and further elaborate personal and collective identity. And once we have identified what is most distinctive about ourselves, we often yearn to fulfill that distinctive potentiality. For instance, let us imagine being presented with the opportunity to learn to paint. Imagine that during this process we discover that we truly enjoy painting and that we find that we can paint particularly well. Indeed we might yearn to further explore this particular form of self-expression. Differentiative desire represents the impulse to pursue all talents and abilities, social, creative, personal, and political. Differentive desire is the desire of the self to become more of itself, more complex, actualized, and elaborate than ever before. Developmental desire, the desire to become. It is here at the conceptual boundaries of the differentiative moment, that the socio-erotic incorporates a developmental dimension. Developmental desire, the fourth finger, represents the desire to fulfill the distinctive talents or abilities which we uncover through. 
the expression of differentiative desire. While we yearn to express who we are, we also seek to fulfill whom we ought to become as well. Developmental desire begins with the assertion I want to become. It represents the striving to bridge the gap between who we are at any given moment, who we could be, and who we ought to be if we had the opportunity, hence, developmental desire is symbolized by the pointer finger, the finger which points to the direction in which the self yearns to go. In our society developmental desire is often reduced to an instrumental motivation for the accumulation of power, status, or capital. Ironically old people who represent the elaborate and savory summation of a lifetime of differentiation and development, are largely regarded as unproductive unless they have accumulated a tremendous amount of capital over the years. Note. Lizzie Donahue. Personal Communication. April 26, 1995. End note. However, despite this narrow view of human development, the desire to develop endures. Developmental desire resurfaces as the relentless craving of the individual to uncover distinctive potentialities and as the collective desire of society to unfold its distinctive possibilities as well. The desire to develop emerges as a restless apprehension, a desire to taste possibility on the tip of our tongues, unable to rest until we taste more. In addition to differentiating ourselves to uncover the widest spectrum of creativity sensuality empathy and personality we also yearn to grow developmentally. In this way, development is linked, but not reducible to differentiation. Understandably many confuse change, growth, and variation with development. We reason that by differentiating ourselves from a particular time, place, or identity we will develop, mature, or evolve. However, Rather than cultivate degrees of maturity or coherence, we may achieve a differentiated stasis. We may have changed our show and taken it on the road, only to find that the road is winding in circles. Hence, differentiation is not equivalent to development. In the case of multiple personality disorder, an individual unconsciously responds to trauma by splitting the personality differentiating the self into a myriad of sub-selves each of which endures and copes with the stress and pain of abuse. In this instance, while the self succeeds in the task of differentiation, it fails to develop into a coherent unity. As a result, an individual suffering from this disorder serves as a host to a diversity of differentiated sub-selves, each lacking the unity and maturity necessary for true development and integration. Developmental desire is precisely the desire of the Self to become increasingly unified within the diversity of its own differentiation. For instance, while we may wish to uncover our distinctive potentialities for creativity sensuality and cooperation, we also yearn to discover an overriding logic that can endow our lives with meaning and wholeness. We can all think of someone in our lives who possesses a myriad of interests yet is incapable of focusing long enough to sufficiently develop a single one. We would say that their focus lacks the very unity or coherence necessary for self-development. In this way, whereas differentiation rounds out the idea of association, development rounds out the idea of differentiation, adding to it a dimension of unity necessary to make the self not only diverse, but dynamic, whole, and meaningful. Hence, development is qualitatively different than a mere process of change or growth. According to Bookshin, the often painful dialectic of a developmental desire is necessary for the differentiation or maturation of the self, desire itself is the sensuous apprehension of possibility a complete psychic synthesis achieved by a yearning for. Without the pain of this dialectic, without the struggle that yields the achievement of the possible growth and desire are divested of all differentiation and content. Note. Murray Bookshin, Post-Scarcity Anarchism, Montreal, Black Rose Books. Reprinted 1986, p. 302. End note. So far, we have been exploring the idea of development on an individual level. Yet such a utopian understanding of development may be applied to society as well. Each society has the potential to express its collective developmental desire to become increasingly differentiated and whole. However, under capitalism, the naturalistic metaphor of growth is deployed to naturalize the immoral hoarding of capital. Within the social Darwinian view of development, the fittest that survive are those who accrue the most profit and power. 
few expect society to become ever more differentiated, dynamic, and whole. Rather than being evaluated qualitatively social development is measured quantitatively as the growth of capital itself. Developmental desire is reduced to the individual desire to differentiate oneself from the masses through the accumulation of capital and social status. This individual desire is then collectivized into the shared desire of most Americans to distinguish themselves from those of less developed third world countries. Meanwhile this social arrogance is predicated on a capitalistic idea of growth, obscuring a true understanding of development as an incremental process in which individuals and society may become qualitatively richer, developing deeply textured capacities for empathy interdependence, and creativity. Hence, the idea of growth, individual or social, is insufficient for cultivating a full understanding of development. As we have seen, True organic development is a process of differentiation and wholeness. In turn, this development entails the act of becoming which is distinguishable from the simple idea of growth. For instance, when a seed unfolds into a flower, the seed does not merely grow or become a bigger seed. If development were simply growth or expansion, then there would be no flowers at all, just gargantuan seeds swaying in the fields. Instead, Something dramatic occurs within the logic of the seed, something within the seed's very structure allows it to differentiate into a new, more elaborate form. The seed gradually gives way to the flower not merely by expanding but by differentiating into an ever more complex organism. This dialectical process of becoming moves from the first thread-like root of the seedling to the upward rising of the stem through the gradual maturation and emergence of the blossom itself. Through this development, the seed is not destroyed, rather, it unfolds within the logical progression of its own internal structure. In this way, we could say that there was something distinctive about the seed's structure which allowed it to engage in this process of becoming, undergoing a series of phases in which it was able to become more of itself. We could say that the flower represents the differentiated expression of the seed's potential for becoming a flower. Note. In the philosophy of social ecology Bookchin provides an in-depth examination of notions of organic development from a dialectical perspective. See Bookchin, Thinking Ecologically in the Philosophy of Social Ecology, Essays on Dialectical Naturalism, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1995. End note. In contrast to this social ecological view of development, Capitalist society regards development as hierarchical, competitive, and determined. Under the rubric of liberal capitalism, to differentiate means to separate and surpass what we were before, assuming a state of superiority over others. Such an approach to development emerges within the deterministic models of development proposed by thinkers such as Hegel or Marx. Whereas these thinkers contributed immeasurably to the world of dialectics, offering an understanding of the logical unfolding of symbolic and material reality respectively, their dialectical approaches retained a determinism that must be transcended. Both thinkers portrayed development as a series of necessary negations, a linear and hierarchical process in which earlier phases of development are necessarily overcome by superior later phases. According to Hegel, whereas change is made possible by the process of contradiction and negation, conflict and opposition represent the only means by which development may occur, thus, out of the bland, static world of being emerges the oppositional, dynamic world of becoming. In order for a thing to become something else it must overcome that which preceded it. Similarly Marx regarded the development of society as a series of necessary negations. For Marx, whereas earlier primitive societies must be overcome by increasingly rational and civilized societies, social history represents an inevitable linear trajectory. Beginning with so-called primitive societies that become increasingly technological, hierarchical, and competitive, history finally gives way to a free and socialist society. In this way, Marx ascribed to a liberal notion of progress, asserting the necessity of hierarchical systems such as capitalism as a stepping stone toward a higher expression of civilization. Moreover, in the same way, Freud follows in this tradition, regarding child development as a series of self-negations or repressions. Whereas maturity is marked by a negation of earlier impulses and desires Freud's rational adult marks the pinnacle of white male self-repression. However, 
the history of society, is not a singular or monolithic event. Society and culture develop in different locations, fashions, and times. Each society must be under stock slow integrally as the summation of its own historical development. Furthermore, the process of social development is uneven, within a given society there may be particular cultural or political practices that are more complex and developed than others. For instance, while one culture may develop a particularly sophisticated system of agricultural or industrial technology that same culture might be marked by a particularly maldeveloped form of governance incorporating violence, dominance, and rigid social stratification. Note. As social ecology and ecofeminism demonstrate the idea of modern development is markedly biased by a capitalistic interpretation of society and nature. As Vandana Shiva illustrates, the capitalist interpretation of development represents a maldevelopment based on unrestrained economic growth, predicated on the work of women and the third world itself. See Vandana Shiva, Staying Alive, Women, Ecology and Development, London, Z Books, 1989, pages 5 to 6. End note. Similarly while one society may practice particularly laborious systems of agriculture, that same society may have developed intricate systems of self-government, nuanced in their degree of non-hierarchy, complementarity, and cooperation. In contrast, new organic dialectical thinkers such as social ecologist Murray Bookchin and psychoanalyst Jessica Benjamin propose an alternative view of development. Indebted to Hegel, both thinkers regard development as cumulative, depicting later phases of development as incorporating earlier ones and bringing them to a level of more complex differentiation. However, for Bookchin and Benjamin, this crucial negative moment, inherent within all processes of development, is mediated by the idea that development may be cumulative, cooperative, potential, and open-ended rather than determined and hierarchical. Bookchin and Benjamin elaborate upon what is best within Hegelian negativism by drawing out a more organic and non-hierarchical view of development. For Hegel, when a self recognizes itself as separate from another self, it annihilate will strive to the other. For Hegel, social relationships are inherently marked by a conflictual struggle for power in which individuals vie for attention and recognition, generally ending in a one-up situation. In contrast, Benjamin asserts that the self may potentially yearn for the presence of others out of a desire to develop. For Benjamin, development does not occur despite others, but because of others, the relationship between an infant and mother is potentially mutually beneficial rather than inherently conflictual. Note. Jessica Benjamin, The Bonds of Love. End note. According to Benjamin, development occurs within a social context preferably within a context that nurtures both individuality and connection. Rather than constitute a series of negations, development represents a series of increasingly complex expressions of relatedness and individuality. For instance, a child does not necessarily have to separate from its mother in order to mature. Rather, it may differentiate itself within that relationship, developing an increasingly nuanced ability to be both related and independent, both recognizing and being recognized by its mother. In this way, Benjamin introduces the idea that development may be a cooperative, dialectical process in which latent abilities for independence and dependence are developed and expressed. In addition to being marked by accumulation and cooperation, human development can be marked by open-endedness and non-determination. For instance, at birth, each individual represents a series of biological and environmental givens. In turn, there exists a degree of chance, or spontaneity that informs how these givens will be organized and how they will evolve. Biological and environmental factors, then, represent a set of potentialities rather than a set of determinants. There exists no determined blueprint which guarantees how an individual will necessarily develop, or whether they will develop at all. Organic life is marked by a dimension of potentiality which provides a horizon of logical yet undetermined possibilities that may or may not unfold. Developmental desire is precisely the desire to develop the particular spectrum of logical possibilities that exists within each of us. It is the desire to participate actively in our own development, differentiating ourselves into what we could be, 
bringing ourselves to a new level of complexity and integration. Developmental desire is not the desire to develop our abilities to dominate or master our earlier or less mature impulses, rather, it is the desire to integrate our earlier child self with our emerging adult self. When this integration is achieved, we are able to retain levels of spontaneity flexibility and authenticity characteristic of the child, integrating these qualities into the cognitive, self-reflexive and empathetic capacities of adulthood. We long to differentiate ourselves, to coherently unfold what is distinctive within us. We yearn as well to develop cooperatively in a spirit of open-endedness and possibility rather than in a spirit of reductive determination. Instead of merely striving to accumulate capital or power, developmental desire represents the desire to develop qualitatively to lead richer, more meaningful lives. Within a free society developmental desire represents the motivation that propels individuals and society toward an open horizon of unending development. However, within the context of liberal capitalism, the full range of cooperative and creative potentiality lies largely undeveloped while a narrow spectrum of competitive and instrumental abilities are nurtured to extremes. Even within this narrow range of acceptable potentialities, it is mainly the most privileged who gain access to the material means by which to develop their abilities, be they intellectual, athletic, artistic, or even the more instrumental abilities such as state politics or business. Hence, we might ask ourselves, what happens to developmental desire in a world which eclipses its utopian potential? Oppositional desire, the desire to fight injustice to explore the fate of developmental desire within the context of social hierarchy, we must uncover within the socio-erotic an oppositional dimension that may potentially emerge as we confront obstacles that impede our full individual and social development. Oppositional desire, the fifth finger of social desire, represents the rational inclination to oppose all individuals, institutions, and ideologies that obstruct the full expression of all forms of social desire be they sensual, associative, differentiative, or developmental. Oppositional desire may be symbolized by the open palm. This first moment of opposition, the moment of critique, represents the act of rationally reflecting upon that which obstructs our expression of other forms of social desire, analyzing the history of oppression, and reasoning out coherent plans for future resistance. When we, metaphorically, read the receptive and integrative palm, we know when to oppose even the desire for opposition, recognizing the appropriate time to wait, listen, and be critical, holding the serious and specific weight of the world in our open hand. However, opposition cannot be waged by contemplative critique alone. When the five fingers of desire come together, they also form a fist of collective or individual defiance. This second moment of opposition, then, the moment of resistance, represents taking passionate and rational action to defy institutions that impede the creation of a just new world. Such acts may be covert or overt, or they may assume the form of armed insurrection or active nonviolence. Throughout history, wherever there is a story of oppression, there is a hidden and unspoken story of resistance. The oppositional desire of the fist held high symbolizes the unity and strength of social and political contestation. Finally opposition requires a third, reconstructive moment. Oppositional desire may be symbolized by the opposable thumb that brings reconstructive and evolutionary possibilities into being through critical invention. Often, the desire for resistance is the mother of invention as oppressive circumstances inspire us to imagine and reason new ways not only to survive but to flourish. Opposition is incomplete without the act of reconstructing a coherent and organically rational vision of the future. It is insufficient to merely critique and contest social and ecological injustice. Opposition enters into its fullness when we begin to think through our oppression to create a desirable new world. The expression of oppositional desire can be suppressed by authority but it cannot be dissipated altogether. Moments of overt oppositional desire emerge in the direct demands for freedom that make up the body of social demonstrations and resistance throughout history. However, Oppositional desire cannot always be expressed overtly. Sometimes, it will assume covered forms ranging from anonymous acts of sabotage to the most subtle expressions of psychological resistance. The socio-erotic, then, represents not just the overt expression of a range of social desire. 
it also represents the potential for social desire, the impulse toward freedom itself. Oppositional desire is the force that pushes green tongues of weeds through cracks of the blandest parking lots, just to say, I will not go away. It is that which inspires us to resist, not just to fulfill our basic material needs, but to express our desire for a particular quality of life, a particular sensuality connectedness, and texture that endows life with meaning and a deep sense of satisfaction. 5 Qualities of Oppositional Desire all five fingers of social desire can be rendered oppositional in a context of social hierarchy and oppression. For instance, sensual desire may assume an oppositional dimension when we oppose forces which obstruct our desire for sexual or sensual self-expression. Women's fight for sexual freedom represents a form of oppositional sensual desire as women fight for the right to love and determine the fate of their own bodies. The movement for lesbian, gay bisexual, and transgendered liberation represents moments of overt oppositional desire when people take action to challenge patriarchal institutions of compulsory heterosexuality. Sensual desire assumes an oppositional dimension when we incorporate our love for beauty into forms of direct action, creating new ways to express dissent and visions of a utopian future through visual art, theater, music, and poetry. The desire for nature, when expressed in oppositional terms, represents as well an expression of oppositional developmental desire. The yearning to restore and elaborate ecological integrity by contesting capitalist and state practices, and the desire to fight the parallel social and ecological injustices that constitute environmental racism reflect what happens when the social desire for nature encounters moments of ecological injustice. The second finger of social desire, associative desire, may assume an oppositional dimension when we resist forces that obstruct cooperation. Resistance to oppressive institutions such as racism, sexism, and capitalism, which counter the desire for mutual recognition, is born out of associative oppositional desire. In turn, social experiments in intentional communities, or worker collectives, represent examples of associative oppositional desire. Attempts to share, barter, or cooperate when such activities are discouraged or prohibited, demonstrate the relentless socio-erotic opposition to the institution of capitalism. In addition, when people risked their lives to work the underground railroads or to hide slaves in the U.S., when a battered woman runs to a phone booth in the middle of the night to call a friend, when a poor woman gives her neighbor money for food, such acts represent expressions of the desire to oppose through association, pushing past institutionalized sources of separation, isolation, and alienation. The third finger of social desire, differentiative desire, may become oppositional when we are confronted by systems of authority that demand expedience and conformity. Oppositional differentiative desire is the push to differentiate our own desire from the desire of those in power. Within the context of hierarchy, differentiative desire takes on a new impulse. Rather than differentiation within the context of a greater cooperative collectivity differentiative desire becomes the desire to differentiate from the ideas, institutions, or individuals in power. Sabotage, often misinterpreted as self-defeating behavior, can represent a vital act of self-assertion. Just as men may misinterpret women's sexual desire as irrational, they may misinterpret women's oppositional desire too, misperceiving women's resistance as incompetence. In Lesbian Ethics, Sarah Lucia Hoagland discusses Donna Deitch's documentary Woman to Woman, in which a working-class housewife describes feelings of frustration and helplessness in regard to her life and work within the home. Note. Sarah Lucia Hoagland, Lesbian Ethics, Toward New Value, Palo Alto, Institute of Lesbian Studies, 1988. End note. At one point in the interview, the woman gets a gleam in her eye lowers her voice, and asks the interviewer, have you ever bought something you don't need? Confessing to the interviewer that she often buys cans of beans she has no intention of using, just to waste her husband's money she concludes, you have to know you're alive, you have to make sure you exist. Note. Ebedum, P40. End note. This desire for agency or self-determination is an act of oppositional differentiative desire. This desire is expressed in a spectrum of sabotage activities ranging from burning dinners to hiding the master's tools on the plantation. 
As Hoagland points out, quote, Acts of sabotage can function to establish that self, to affirm a woman's separateness in her own mind. It may be more important to the woman who burns dinners to remind herself, and maybe her husband, that he cannot take her for granted than it is for her to rise socially and economically. And it may be more important to the slave that she affirm her existence by thwarting the master's plan in some way than it is to secure safety in a situation in which believing she is safe is dangerously foolish. If a woman establishes herself as separate, at least in her own awareness, from the will of him who dominates by making certain decisions and carrying them out, then those choices are not self-defeating, since without them there would be no self to defeat. End quote. Note. Ebedum, p. 47 End note. Differentiative desire lies at the heart of oppositional desire. Through opposing the power which oppresses us, we differentiate ourselves from that power, asserting our independent desire for freedom. Often, the cost of differentiative oppositional desire is our own physical defeat, a sacrifice that challenges an exclusively materialist interpretation of social resistance. Predicating social and political resistance on material necessity alone can never account for the ways in which the subjugated often forego their own physical security, safety, and even survival in order to maintain an integral sense of selfhood and community. The fourth finger of desire, developmental desire, assumes an oppositional dimension when confronted by obstacles to self-development on an individual, social, or community level. Social hierarchy functions to stay the development of those at the bottom. This pressing down on individual and social development takes place on levels that are physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, ethical, and creative. For instance, within many capitalist cultures women are diskilled technologically and intellectually, instilling a lack of confidence and competence in abilities that should belong to both sexes. Within liberal capitalist societies, knowledge regarding such areas as sexuality health, and technology is often stolen from women and other oppressed peoples to be hoarded and controlled within centralized institutions such as hospitals, universities, corporations, and governments. In the crisis today over intellectual property rights, first world corporations steal and patent seeds cultivated over thousands of years by indigenous peoples in the third world. The goal of such capitalistic exploits is to centralize the cultivation and distribution of seeds, diskilling local farmers in the process. Unless interrupted, such action threatens to erase not only local agricultural knowledge but the communal and historical development of agricultural knowledge itself. Note. Sivandana Shiva, The Seed and the Earth, Biotechnology and the Colonization of Regeneration, in Close to Home, ed. Vandana Shiva, Philadelphia, New Society Publishers, 1994. End note. In addition, while the oppressed are often diskilled, they are also toggled to forego their own developmental desire. In many societies, women are encouraged to engage in vicarious expressions of desire, nurturing the development of children and men. Viewed as less developed than the mature male capitalist subject, for example women are often described as being closer to nature, a nature that is in turn portrayed as lowly and static, deprived of developmental, self-organizing properties. Accordingly women, like nature, must await the animating principle of man and his technology and intellect in order to develop or grow. As Simone de Beauvoir points out in The Second Sex, only elite modem man can ever hope to gain development, or transcendence over the alleged stasis and repetition of the natural world. Note. Simone de Beauvoir, The Second Sex, Second Ed. New York, Vintage Books, 1952. End note. Women and the rest of the oppressed must remain within imminence, or within a state of unending latency without any hope for development. Developmental desire becomes oppositional when people begin to acknowledge and elaborate the development which they have achieved. In 1936, the Mujeres Libres, an anarchist organization of free women who fought in the Spanish Civil War, established self-development as a central focus in women's revolutionary work. Like most social anarchists, the Mujeres Libres regarded the transformation of the self as crucial to the transformation of society. Note. Martha Acklesberg, Free Women of Spain, 
Anarchism and the Struggle for the Emancipation of Women, Bloomington, Indiana University Press, 1991, p. 57. End note. Transcending a Marxian-oriented needs agenda, the Mujeres Libres asserted women's desire for social freedom, working to develop new skills and abilities while fighting to create a qualitatively new society. In particular, the Mujeres Libres established capacitation, an agenda which prepared women for revolutionary engagement, and captación, which incorporated women into the libertarian movement. This dual orientation was expressed clearly in its statement of purpose quote, To create a conscientious and responsible female force originally, a revolutionary force that can act as a vanguard of progress, and to this end, to establish schools, institutes, conferences, special courses, etc., designed to empower women and emancipate them from the triple enslavement to which they have been, and continue to be, subject, the enslavement of ignorance, enslavement as a woman, and enslavement as a worker. End quote. Note. Ebedum, p. 115 End Note Through an agenda of captation, women focused on developing their participation within anarchist organizations. Due to the widespread neglect of women's issues by the larger anarcho-syndicalist movement, the Mujeres Libres addressed social and economic oppression that specifically affected women, working to overcome those obstacles, to integrate women into the wider revolutionary movement. Note Ebedum, p. 116 End Note In turn, through capacitation, women expressed their desire to re-establish their capacities for both social and self-renewal. While their education focused primarily on the areas of literacy and sexual education, they emphasized as well a wide range of other skills that would prepare women for their life and work in the new anarchist society. In the fall of 1936, the Mujeres Libres in Barcelona offered intensive courses in general culture, social history, economics, and law in its offices in the Plaza de Cataluna. Regardless of the topic, the theme was the same, women must take responsibility for their own development, education, and participation within the larger movement. Oppositional developmental desire has continued to surface throughout history as people challenge conditions of personal and collective stasis caused by oppression. During the New Left for example feminists established a developmental agenda, creating consciousness-raising groups designed to allow women to increase awareness of oppressive gender roles. In turn, in the Third World, beginning in 1977, women have expressed developmental oppositional desire in the Green Belt movement in Kenya. In this movement, activist and scholar Wangari Mathai formed a network of grassroots educational and activist groups throughout that country to prepare women to address the parallel crises of deforestation and poverty. Training women to work in such areas as seed cultivation, marketing, and forest management, the Green Belt movement restored green areas around school compounds and city limits throughout the country. Seeking more than ecological and economic restoration however, the Green Belt movement allowed women to develop their status as holders of expert knowledge. Note. Annabel Rada, Women and the Environment, London, Z Books Limited, 1991, p. 111. End note. Expressing oppositional desire is a way to feel alive in a world which deadens our yearning for freedom. To resist, on an individual and social level, is vital to the revolutionary project. When people forget that they possess the very means for social change, they become ignorant of their own potential for dynamism and self-development. When people see themselves as stuck, they are likely to believe that the world is inevitably unchangeable as well. When we lose confidence in our ability to develop new oppositional ways of being, we lose faith in our ability to change the world. Propelled by our oppositional desire, we have the potential to challenge the big lie of stasis that teaches us that the world is controlled by an unchanging set of natural laws that keeps each thing and each person in place. Once we recognize that we can fight oppression to become more sensual, cooperative, creative, and whole the big static book of natural law loses its yellowed pages as they scatter in the winds of opposition. The socio-erotic, toward an informed desire. 
the five dimensions of desire provide a way to talk about qualitative dimensions of reality without appealing to spiritual or purely intuitive explanations, a way to translate that which is conventionally called spiritual into that which is erotic. Yet such an approach requires a rethinking of vernacular understandings of meaning that are commonly contrasted against the idea of reason. In a world of capitalist rationalization, a world that reduces social and ecological relationships to standardized units of profit, it is tempting to appeal to ideas of sacredness or spirit to convey the poetry of life, dimensions of reality that cannot be reduced to instrumental or linear reason. However, when we equate all that is rich, deep, and intensely meaningful with that which is not rational, we conflate rationalization with rationality failing in turn to recognize moments of organic rationality and history within what is usually invoked as spiritual. We fail to realize that we can use reason to create structures and ways of being that are intensely meaningful in the most cooperative and liberatory sense. Again, the desire to assert a dimension of life that cannot be bought, sold, or biologically determined moves us to embrace the idiom of spiritus rather than that of rationality or cooperative relationality. Believing that rationality is inherently reductive, we posit the poetry sensuality and interrelatedness of life as a kind of universal essence or energy that flows through the world, a kind of activating principle that is beyond history or reason. Yet there are other more relational, rational, and historical ways to describe moments of holism, ways to articulate instances in which the whole cannot be reduced to a mere sum of its parts. The idiom of the socio-erotic provides a way to point to such qualitatively irreducible moments, reconfiguring the dimensions of social desire as social rather than spiritual or intuitive, rational rather than irrational, historical rather than universal, and common rather than sacred. The socio-erotic, then, provides a way to talk about that which is rational and irreducible that which is poetic and rational, historical, and social. Social desires are marked by moments of rationality or logic that are reflective of the historical, social, and political contexts in which they emerge. Note. A number of feminist theorists have explored the false dichotomy between reason and emotion. For a particularly clear and elucidating exploration, see Alison M. Jagger, Love, and Knowledge. Emotion in Feminist Epistemology, in Gender-Body-Knowledge, eds Allison M. Jagger and Susan R. Bordeaux, New Brunswick, Rutgers University Press, 1989. End note. In this way, the socio-erotic is not a universal, irrational essence or spirit, rather, it represents a way to talk about a range of social desires that are informed by an answerable to historically situated cultural practice. Moving beyond essentialist ideas of spirits, energies, forces, or drives, we may uncover the most meaningful and social implications of cooperative relationality itself. As social creatures then, our most meaningful and cooperative social yearnings are marked by an underlying rational, historical, and relational logic. When participants in the civil rights movement yearned for social justice, for example such yearnings were not a priori, or instinctual. Instead, they reflected historically rooted and rational understandings of what ideas of race, justice, and injustice meant during the post-war period of post-slavery America. The social desire articulated through the poetic prose of James Baldwin reflects a highly rational mind capable of articulating compelling arguments against racism and heterosexism in a language of sensuality and profound emotion. Baldwin's creativity cannot be explained as a simple energy force, or drive but as an expression of a particular relationality, a meditation upon a rich matrix of social and political relationships that Baldwin observed, lived, and reflected upon in a particular place and time in history. By describing the social desire of Baldwin as a merely intuitive expression, we miss the profoundly historical, rational, and relational nature of this artist's work. Articulated through the language of the socio-erotic, we may see moments of sensual desire in Baldwin's prose a relational desire for a quality of mutual recognition that countered racism, classism, and heterosexism. Baldwin expressed a rational desire for association in his discussions of brotherhood, unity, love, and compassion. Yet again, rather than represent essential intuitions or an expression of spirit, 
we may recognize within the genius of Baldwin the ability to seamlessly join a critique of political and social structures with a plea for a sensuous expression of human compassion and unity. Baldwin's reflection upon his own thirst for creativity sensuality and knowledge as a young black man in Harlem in the 1940s, a desire that sent him to the public library, to the pulpit, and into the arms of young men, represents not an irrational spiritual drive or intuition but a highly rational and historically situated expression of a relational differentiative and developmental desire. In turn, Baldwin's writings against racism represent sensually articulated expressions of oppositional desire, a desire that is impassioned and marked by an undeniable logic, quote. At bottom, to be colored means that one has been caught in some utterly unbelievable cosmic joke, a joke so hideous and in such bad taste that it defeats all categories and definitions. One's only hope of supporting, to say nothing of surviving, this joke is to flaunt in the teeth of it one's own particular and invincible style. It is at this turning, this level, that the word color, ravaged by experience and heavy with the weight of peculiar spoils, returns to its first meaning, which is not negro, the Spanish word for black, but vivid, many-hued, the rainbow, and warm and quick and vital. Life. End quote. Note. James Baldwin, Color, in The Price of the Ticket, Collected Nonfiction 1948-1985, New York, St. Martins, 1985, p. 320. End note. To attribute Baldwin's genius to Spiritus denies the distinctly embodied, historical and human quality of this work. By identifying Baldwin's genius as an expression of social desire, we may reclaim an appreciation of the human potential for making liberatory, creative, and meaningful connections out of the matrix of social relationships themselves. We may indeed describe Baldwin's work as socio-erotic. Yet recognizing the historicity and sociality of our social desires does not imply that we should rationalize or reduce such experiences to behaviors that are operative, biologically determined, or merely socially constructed to fulfill some adaptive function. Appreciating the socio-erotic does not entail that we become self-conscious each time we engage in meaningful activity wringing the poetry out of each experience by analyzing its rational and political implications. To be sure, there are some experiences that are degraded by in-the-moment analysis, the poetry of sexuality artistic expression, and parental love, for instance, may be compromised by constant appeals to critical self-reflection. What makes a particular song beautiful or pleasurable is often the ability to temporarily lose or suspend self-awareness, allowing the self to dissolve into a delicious rhythm. However, it is naive and perhaps even dangerous to think that because we can suspend awareness of the rationality or history underpinning such experiences, because we can shift awareness away from what it is that makes us label a particular song, face, or mountain as beautiful, that those inscriptions of what is beautiful stand outside the realms of rationality or history. Assertions of irrationality or intuition as epistemologically more authentic or immediate than reason are predicated on the myth that reason is the opposite of intuition. However, intuition often constitutes a pre-reflexive expression of rationality, when intuitions are right, they reflect historically grounded insights that we have rationally cultivated about the world, when they are wrong, they often reflect more about ourselves and our unconscious desires. Intuitions can, indeed, often be wrong and destructive, whereas Hitler intuited that the Jews were a subhuman enemy to the German Heimat or homeland and anti-abortionists intuit that first trimester fetuses are babies that should be protected, there exist many men who intuit that their wives are unfaithful, and deserve a beating. Conversely many intuitions, defined as irrational, or pre-rational, are often grounded in highly refined bodies of local knowledge. So often throughout the history of the patriarchal and colonial West, Women's intuitions and indigenous folk knowledge are cast as irrational to dismiss highly rational understandings of human behavior and natural processes. The Enlightenment's failure to transcend misguided and solipsistic views of rationality views that often dismissed the rational knowledge of the marginalized, may inspire us to cultivate new ways of approaching questions of rationality so central to feminist and subaltern epistemology. As we reject reductive discussions of rationality we may engender epistemological options beyond appeals to spirituality and intuition.
The idea of the socio-erotic represents an embodied and historical approach to questions of meaning, connectedness, sensuality development, and moral opposition. A rationally informed social desire, a desire informed, provides a radical new approach to such crucial questions, so central to the social and ecological struggle. The socio-erotic provides a metaphor that better resonates with the shift from a spirituality-based essentialism to a historically situated relationality. By appreciating the meaning of the socio-erotic, the dimensions of social desire, we valorize the immense beauty power, and intelligence that marks our most sensual, empathetic, and developmental ways of relating. Far from being reductive, we may elaborate an appreciation for the stunning potential of humanity to express its relationality in sensual, creative, and dynamic ways. Thus, if the socio-erotic is the opposite of anything, it is not spirituality or the sacred, but to capitalist rationalization, and an anti-humanism that reduces humanity to a cold and controlling anti-social species, a portrayal that dismisses and trivializes the potential of humanity for engendering institutions that nurture the most empathetic and sensual expression of social and ecological relationships. By viewing meaningful experiences through the lens of the socio-erotic we regain a poetic appreciation of the diverse expressions of human sociality. We root our goodness not in spirituality or in romantic purity but in our humanness, a humanness that is derived from and constituted by natural history itself. It is deeply radical to assert what is potentially good in humanity during cruel and truly anti-human times such as these. In a neoliberal era in which the majority of humanity is exploited, despised, and tyrannized, it is an act of the greatest empathy to recognize within those who are not free, the potential for beauty intelligence, cooperation, and freedom. In an era dominated by Christianity and neoliberal capitalism, it is tempting to yield to portrayals of a humanity that is inevitably flawed, selfish, and ecologically destructive, a species inherently opposed to an innocent and pristine natural world. The anti-humanism that pervades the radical ecology movement, an anti-humanism that encodes knowledge and rationality as sinful or regressive, perpetuates the religious myth of a world that fell because of humanity's quest for knowledge and pleasure. In turn, the romantic idealism that marks ecological discussions encourages us to idealize nature, while hating our flawed selves, rather than resist social institutions that allow the anti-social few to degrade the rest of humanity and the natural world. Ecological romanticism allows us to keep social hierarchies intact. Constructing idealized nature preserves or natural products for the pleasure and guilt reduction of the privileged few. The socio-erotic represents the attempt to further differentiate the idea of social desire, differentiating in turn, the cooperative impulse itself, elaborating the desire for mutualism and an ethical and oppositional progression toward a utopian horizon. Our vocabulary for describing moments of desire has been impoverished for centuries, indeed it has been limited to the language of energistic, individualistic, and romantic drives for material acquisition, status, and personal sensual pleasure. We need to develop a new language of desire, offering ourselves a broader palette of colors to paint ever finer shades of meaning, subtlety, and nuance. Thinking through the socio-erotic represents one step toward developing this language, moving us toward a greater fluency in the language of freedom itself. We need to rationally fall in love with what is potentially most empathetic and progressive within social relationships. By focusing on the quality of relationships to self, others, and to the rest of the natural world, we move away from appeals to universalizing essences, to articulate crucial cultural meanings and social relationships. Trusting ourselves to think compassionately organically and relationally we may take the apple of knowledge into both hands and bite down hard.